Yo, yo, what's up, everybody? It's Michael Rappaport from such great cinematic hits as Zebra Head and Arrested <laughs> Development. You might have remembered me from that show. Yo, I'm in Israel, bro. It is so dope to be here while we're committing genocide because I am a D-list actor. I don't know the first thing about Israel, but I'm here because I want some kind of shine after my career fell apart. And I'm here with a whole bunch of nobodies like Eve Fartlow and Lee Kern. Whoever heard of that dude? Yo! And I'm here with uh, uh, Deborah Messing. What is Deborah? She's indigenous to this land. White ladies are indigenous to Israel. Noah Tishby told me that, yo. And you're going to say that Zionism is settler colonialism, yo? Are you serious? And I actually have no punchlines or anything funny to say. I'm just all attitude and impersonating somebody else that I'm not really, that I played in Zebrahead. So, yo, that's that's my career. My career is... Supporting genocide. We got Jerry Seinfeld, genocide Jerry in the house. What is the deal with Palestinian civilians? Why are they like going where the bombs are? Why don't they go where the bombs aren't? Where Israel tells them to go, yo. Aaron Mate. What's up, baby? Hello, Michael. Hello. Hello. Yo. Um, That's pretty good. That's a pretty good depression right there yeah, right. I mean, yeah. yeah i'm gonna it, take it, off my uh take off my i just had some old police hat gotta take off my michael rapaport hat it makes sense that someone who's such a phony who like made his career off of like appropriating hip-hop culture happens to also be a fanatic supporter of israel there is a totally. lot of synchronicity there for sure totally uh well he it's like he wants to have an identity I guess I probably shouldn't put this hat on. <laughs> I bought at a gift shop in Gaza City, took through uh, the Erez crossing under the noses of Israeli security. That gift shop has since been bombed. It there's no it is no more. It was probably looted. I'll just go with this one. Nice. I'm not really a hat guy. This doesn't really fit my head. I look kind of like but it's a good hat. <laughs> What is with Rappaport and all these guys who wear their hats like that? Like, yo, I'm trying to look as low, like, I'm trying to look like as ridiculous as possible. <laughs> yo, can you believe they arrested all those Hamas guys? Hundreds of them all took their shirts off and handed the guns over after taking their shirts off. Can you believe that? They actually did that, yo. Hamas is surrendering, bro. I believe anything they tell me. Turns out I'm an actor and I impersonate a human. And I'm not even a human to impersonate because I'm a Zionist. <laughs> All right. Let's yeah. start the show. Let's, let's start, start the show. show. But thanks for that, Max. I think people need some comic relief well right i kind of like got called when i was growing up in dc people would call me zebra head because i looked like him kind of <laughs> it was on in the in the majority black part of the city where i grew up every time i walked out of my house for like a few months it was that then the movie white men can't jump came out so i was known as white men can't jump or woody harrelson but then when i would go to my school in the little white enclave of dc everyone would call me steve from 90210 because that's what they would watch uh -huh. there yeah i can see that resemblance for sure for sure um yeah i'd prefer like ian zering has lived a more dignified life than michael rapaport he's you know been on the chippendales tour yeah he was in, in shark he was in sharknado to sharknado him. great yeah. film yeah yeah way more dignified than michael rapaport uh yes yeah i mean they don't even realize i don't even think they realize like how the rest of the world sees them and that and that's the crazy thing but no. we came to uh to bring the pain not talk about d-listers all the time it was just like this was like a little 
comic bit we came up with two minutes before the stream started. <clears throat> so yeah, yeah, Sharknado is a gem. Uh, shout out to all the Frank Zappa enjoyers who caught the uh, the title of the stream today. That's Torture Never Stops from Zoot Allures. And it really feels like the torture will never stop, Aaron, because the only country with enough leverage to, ga to gain a ceasefire is fully invested in this genocidal assault on the Gaza Strip. And uh, it looks as though there's no end in sight to the suffering of the civilian population in Gaza, even as Israel's military falters, not only in Gaza, but on the Northern Front, uh, where it's in taking, taking increasing casualties. We're gonna talk about that. Um, we're going to talk about attacks on the gray zone by a particularly sloppy nation columnist, uh, which flow will flow into our discussion about the New York Times new front page feature, alleging that there was a systematic campaign of rape and sexual assault by Hamas on October 7th. And I think we need to talk about Ukraine because we're getting to the denouement of a issue that we've been covering pretty much nonstop for the last two years. And Aaron, you got a new piece out about that today. So um, I don't know how we should get started. I mean, I think, I think we should get started by um, talking about the news, which yes. is that the government of South Africa has invoked the genocide convention. This is highly significant. There it is. Thanks for getting that up. Um, I don't know if you have anything you want to say about this, Aaron, or what you think about the significance of this invocation. Well, it's obviously long overdue. This should have happened, you know, uh, months ago, but it's good. It's finally happening now. And of course it's fitting that it comes from South Africa, which like Israel, um, was once a U.S. client state whose crimes were protected by the U.S. And South Africa, having liberated itself from that, knows a lot about apartheid and living under a supremacist regime. So good for them for taking the leadership, finally, the moral leadership, and invoking uh, international law to protect the people of Gaza from this genocidal regime. And uh, again, having... And there's another... Uh, historical overlap here and that Israel was a key supporter of the apartheid regime in South Africa, uh, especially when the U.S. wasn't able to provide all the support to the apartheid regime that it wanted to because of, you know, public criticism and oversight. It got Israel to do the, the dirty work for it, as, is, as Israel did all around the world for the U.S. when it needed to uh, evade scrutiny. So really symbolic and important that South Africa has taken this measure. Yeah, actually, fun fact, uh, Arnon Mil Milchan, who is one of the most famous Mossad agents who ran a studio in Hollywood called Regent Studios, where he employed and mentored the future Israeli Prime Minister Yair Lapid, helped South Africa get nuclear technology through mm -hmm. the nuclear technology that Israel obtained. Yes. Um, <clears throat> Israel's very, very sorry that a South Africa is no longer an apartheid state. They work together very closely. They shared a lot of values. And Israel is anachronistic in history as the last real apartheid state in implementing genocide in order to preserve its own ethnic purity. That's exactly yeah. what's happening right now. So the moral force of this invocation by South Africa is highly significant. It's an 84-page document. It came out like two hours ago. So I haven't had a chance to I'm probably not going to read all 84 pages. It's not going to happen. Um, I, I, I never like, I don't read the full, like le all the legal filings against Trump either. I just like, I'm like, what's Michael Tracy going to say about this? Cause it gets really exhausting. Um, I think we're going to see more and more legal filings against Israel uh, in the future. And I mean, this, this, this will be necessary from third party countries I'm thinking of Latin American countries. And I think the most important country to sign on would be Brazil that I could see possibly signing on. But smaller countries like Bolivia, Cuba, 
Nicaragua, the, the leftist countries in Latin America should sign on because that will create more pressure for this inquiry at the International Court of Justice or the World Court, which is more open and ha has, has a long standing investigation of Israel uh, pending, <clears throat> unlike the ICC, which has been completely controlled by the United States through Kareem Khan. And we've talked about this a lot at the Gray Zone. I've reported on it, how Kareem Khan uh, pr issued an indictment for Vladimir Putin for evacuating ethnically Russian children from the war zone to the Russian Federation on the grounds that he's stealing all these children. And then when Israel comes around and commits the most blatant, brazen genocide of our times, he goes to Israel and meets with October 7th victims, October 7th survivors. That's what Kareem Khan does. Yeah. But what this will do if the ICJ and when the ICJ takes this case on is it will force the ICC to acknowledge the case and it will force the issue and the language of genocide into the mainstream as Sam Husseini, our friend, uh, the DC-based independent journalist, has been saying as he's been clamoring <clears throat> for countries to take this on is that it will force the mainstream media to grapple with the issue of genocide in the Gaza Strip. Um, so I think you know, it's important morally, legally, and um, in terms of forcing the issue into the media. Yeah, let me read a bit from uh, South Africa's submission. They say that Israel, since October 7th, has failed to prevent genocide and has failed to prosecute the direct and public incitement to genocide, Israel has engaged in, is engaging in, and risks further engaging in genocidal acts against the Palestinian people in Gaza. So invoking the Genocide Convention, after the recent anniversary, by the way, of the Genocide Convention, I believe 75 years, um, to try to uh, stop what's going on. It, it's hugely significant. And again, just the fact that South Africa, you know, which liberated itself from apartheid is doing this. It shows really wh where the moral leadership of the world is. The Biden yeah. administration uh, loves to brag about how it leads everybody, how it united everybody uh, to back its proxy war in Ukraine, which is not even true. A whole lot of countries oppose what the U.S. did. But on this issue especially, the U.S. is virtually alone in backing Israel's genocide, and now South Africa is standing up to it. Yes, South Africa, which just hosted the BRICS summit, which we covered, Anya Parampil covered for us, and represents the disruption and possible breaking of the U.S. financial stranglehold on the world economic system, on dollar hegemony. I think this case represents a glacial shift in the international legal architecture and the attempt by the collective West and specifically the U.S. to dominate every multilateral institution in order to protect itself and Israel specifically. Um, one institution they've sought to dominate and control would be the OPCW, which you talk about all the time, Aaron. Here, I mean, it's a clear-cut case. <clears throat> you have a nation which is intends to eliminate in whole or part uh, an entire population based on their ethno-religious character because they do not fit into the so-called Jewish state. And you have clear genocidal intent expressed at the highest levels of Israeli leadership. They're saying what they want to do, whether or not the U.S. media wants to report it or not. I mean, it's, it's amazing how the New York Times or the Washington Post, which has been much better than the Times, will not do an article on what Israeli leaders are saying about what they aim to do in Gaza. It's always kind of alluded to, you know, voluntary transfer. And I'll talk a little bit more about that. But this is like one of the latest iterations of genocidal intent expressed by a very significant figure in Israel. I think this is one of the most grotesque, grotesquely blatant expressions of genocide. And this is uh, Eliyahu Yossein, who is a veteran of the Unit 8200 Cyber Division of the Israeli Army, um, which is one of its most important divisions with respect to Gaza. 
He's saying Hamas doesn't control Gaza. It is not the enemy. Gaza contains Hamas. Hamas is not the enemy. Gaza is the enemy. And as soon as we alter the terminology, the understanding of the situation will change. And the definition of the enemy will be different. The way it's not important who you warn or who evacuates a neighborhood. This is what is called flattening the area, leveling the ground. You ask me what I would do, and the answer is simply leveling the ground and to kill the largest number possible. Because the woman there is an enemy, the baby there is an enemy, and the first grader is an enemy, and the Hamas militant is an enemy, and the pregnant woman is an enemy, because we see with our eyes. Why then could we not absorb Western values? Because they blur basic logic. Because we see a boy carrying chocolate in his hand, yet the same boy will learn how to use a Kalashnikov in the first grade. So that's Israeli logic. That's the Israeli military doctrine. The first grader is an enemy. The grandmother is an enemy. The pregnant woman is an enemy. The baby is an enemy. We must flatten the ground. It is the same logic that was expressed during the early 1980s by the genocidal Guatemalan dictator whose armed forces were trained by Israel, Ephraim Rios Mont, who said that if you can't catch the fish, you must drain the sea. And that is precisely what Israel's saying that it's doing here. Western media doesn't want to quote them, though they're like, oh, they are intensifying strikes against Hamas. When Israel destroyed the, like, killed 70 to 80 people in the Maghazi refugee camp in central Gaza, I was looking for the headline, Israel kills 70 in one strike, all civilians. There was no headline like that in the Washington Post and the New York Times. It just said, Israel intensifies strikes against Hamas. But they're saying in here, this will all be entered as evidence in the ICJ case. So will um, the expressions of genocidal intent contained in my piece, What is Wrong with Israelis, which you can watch. It's age-gated and demonetized at our YouTube channel. It's on our Twitter account where you can still see things that are real. Um, I can't play that piece here because then this live stream will be automatically demonetized, although it'll probably be anyway. You know, just looking at the hospitals, right, the line that Israel has crossed here and how they've basically normalized something that was previously off limits to everybody which is systemically attacking hospitals now there's i believe there's four hospitals in gaza that are left operational four out of uh more than two dozen at least i think there's maybe more than 30 hospitals in gaza four are left operational um that's unprecedented when the u.s bombed that hospital in afghanistan in kunduz i believe it was called the uh, U.S. sort of said that was a mistake. We didn't mean to do that, which was probably a lie. But the point is they at least had to own up to it and, and you know, uh, say it wouldn't happen again. Here, Israel deliberately, methodically attacks hospitals, attacks the people inside, um, uh, runs over uh, people with bulldozers outside. I mean, every single line has been crossed and nothing that Israel does is too far for the Biden administration. As the Biden administration said, we have no red lines. Israel can do whatever it wants. It has carte blanche, even to attack hospitals in Gaza, to take them operational, so, to not only commit genocide, but make sure that the basic institution required to keep people possibly alive or you know, save them, uh, you know, uh, treat them, fix their wounds, cannot actually meet people's needs. This is inside Shifa Hospital in Gaza City on December 26th. Uh, much of the hospital has been destroyed by Israeli raids. The hospital is sort of limping along, and you can see they're treating extremely wounded people on the floor. Uh, this footage is courtesy of Gaza's Ministry of Health. Uh, wounded children on the floor, people taking IVs. Uh, it's a horror scene. And this is, you know, Israel's denounced the uh, South Africa invocation of the genocide convention as blood libel Do, are these people not bleeding is their blood not real are you are you not doing this are you not deliberately targeting civilians according to one of the most influential people in unit 8200 who teaches 
other members of this cybersecurity spying unit, which is involved in all the targeting in Gaza. They're the ones who help determine the targets by uh, spying on residents of the Gaza Strip. Here's a walk through uh, the parts of Shifa Hospital that were destroyed by Israel. Uh, staff on this tour. I mean, these are... People were here? Yeah. And they died here. Uh, intensive care unit, I think. And people were killed here. This is a tank shell. And the mosque was hit as well? And you can see the Al Rimal neighborhood around. It's almost entirely destroyed. Six people died downstairs? Yes. And people were hit here? Okay. We need to go, I'm sorry. I mean, this is an entire wing of the hospital. All because uh, they said there were Hamas tunnels under the hospital. This is unbelievable. This was signed off on by Tony Blinken and the State Department. Yeah, on the last stream, we covered this, how the Biden administration laundered these lies for Israel about a Hamas command center underneath the hospital. And again, it has to be said, even if that were true, it still wouldn't justify Israel firing a single bullet at the hospital. They don't have the right to fire a single bullet into Gaza to begin with. They only have the obligation to end the occupation. But putting that aside, it wasn't even true. There was no Hamas command center under Al Shifa. It was a complete lie. The Biden administration pushed it. U.S. media stenographers in the New York Times and elsewhere laundered it for them. And now everyone's just forgotten about that. They've moved on to the next, um, uh, you know, talking point to, to to justify the atrocity. And you know, look, it, there's so many things to discuss on all these issues. But just watching this footage and thinking about how unprecedented this is to have this coordinated campaign of attacking hospitals. You know, like the one time I went to Gaza and from speaking to people from Gaza, the, Max, I'm curious your thoughts on this. They're very proud of their hospital system. They're very proud of how many doctors they trained, how even under occupation, under a siege, they're able to have a functioning healthcare system that trains people, that educates people. You know, people from Gaza could, many people could go live abroad and make a higher salary and have a decent life, but they've chosen to go and stay in Gaza and serve their people. And Israel, I feel along with just trying to just, you know, kill, kill as many people as they can. It's also just trying to destroy the culture, the spirit, the resilience of these people, the pride they have in their homeland and its healthcare system. Well, that's yes, that is essential to Israel's military strategy in the Gaza Strip is destroying all the institutions, killing, they're killing doctors. They've killed over 4,000 students. Um, that's an, a, a, a statistic I just saw from Gaza's Ministry of Health. We, we've talked about Rifat al -Arir. Many prominent intellectuals in Gaza are being killed. Th 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 this, this strategy really came into, bear, came into being um, the strategy of targeting the intelligentsia and institutions towards the end of the 2014 Operation Protective Edge assault on the Gaza Strip, when that area of Al Rimal and the, the middle class areas of Gaza City came under attack for absolutely no reason, like the Zafar Tower, which was known as Fatah City because so many people affiliated with Fatah who are not Hamas, who were middle class, that was taken down. The Italian compound, another tower of prominent people, was taken down 30 stories. Uh, hundreds of families lost their homes and it was a message and they were saying even if you even if you live there if you do not take on Hamas and remove them we're just going to take you all out and that was a message for next time because everyone knew on the Palestinian side on the Israeli side that 51 day war in 2014 was simply a prelude to a much bigger war um, and this war will not be the last this one we're witnessing now, because of the amount of destruction, unless there's a proper resolution, the amount of destruction in Gaza will lead to another war. Um, and it provides no other infrastructure beyond the summer camps Hamas runs for children, the Al Qassam brigades that provide a structure for youth who've lost their entire families for young men. There's nothing else left. 
Um, and if they eradicate that, what will be left? Some kind of nihilistic ISIS-like entity? I don't even know what will be left. So this is all part of Israel's strategy. You're right. And and Gaza, Gaza had a, you know, its medical system was always under attack. The last time I was there, um, there was a strike because the Palestinian Authority refused to authorize funding because of a dispute with Hamas to the hospital. So Shifa Hospital had all this medical waste piling up outside its uh, dialysis room for kidney patients. And they were just getting volunteers to come in, guys from the street, um, out of the goodness of their hearts to clean up medical waste. But 96% of the Gaza Strip, there's a 96% literacy rate. People take schooling and education very, very seriously. Their grades are called out from the mosques at the end of every semester of all the kids. Yeah. And edu education is, is paramount. Um, whereas Israelis portray people in Gaza as you know stupid people who are like, you know, ignorant terrorists. They don't they don't have any contact with them. So how would they know? Um, and that's part of the dehumanization. And yeah, I mean, when we talk about the destruction of institutions that took place in, this was in part of, in phase one of Israel's war on Gaza. The war is phased in three parts, according to Israel. We're now in phase two. So phase one, they called it a success because they were managed to occupy the north of Gaza, destroy the main institutions of Hamas government, which was simply Gaza's government. And they've created what they kind of call a buffer zone. It's not a real victory. It's a Pyrrhic victory. And um, from a military standpoint, when Israeli media announces, for example, a strategic hold in Shujaia, which is the real power base of the Al-Qassam brigades and their tunnel network, they're still taking hits there. They're still taking bodies there. The strategy of Al-Qassam and the other resistance factions is not to hold territory. It's to um, bleed the occupying force. So then you have the middle of Gaza. They're starting to move there now. That's why this Magazi camp massacre took place. They're starting to attack the people in the areas where they told the people from the north to go. And they're creating pressure there through massacres to start to push them even further south towards Khan Yunus and Rafa. Israeli forces are now east of Khan Yunus in an area that's always intensely contested during military confrontation since 2014 called Hosea. They're taking a lot of casualties, the Israelis are. There's intense fighting there. They believe that Hamas leadership is concentrated in Khan Yunus. They're stepping up bombing, killing lots of people, and they're starting to hit Rafa, which is where many of the new refugee camps, where you see people sleeping in tents in the open in the rain, that's where much of the population has been pushed. So they think that in phase two, they can start to actually push into Khan Yunus with their tanks and start actually pursuing their, their fantasy of capturing Yahya Senwar, the prime minister, and breaking open all these tunnel networks. And then, But the real objective is not to go after Hamas. They're going after the civilian population. And what they want to do is push them all further south. And then in phase three, Phase three is a total attack on the civilian population that's trapped in the south. And Israel will likely declare a buffer zone in this area called the Philadelphia Corridor. You, remember, you, you probably you know about that. I remember back in the day, Democracy Now!, they always used to report on Israel's, uh, one of the only networks then, reporting on Israel's occupation of this area between Gaza's Rafah city and the Egyptian side, the Philadelphia quarter, that's where Rachel Corey was killed. Mm. The bulldozers were taking out all the homes there. That's when they created that corridor. So if the Israeli military gets there again, they can trap the Palestinian population there and then and put political pressure on Egypt and say, we're not going to, you're all dying. You need to get out to Egypt. We're only going to let this happen if you take hundreds of thousands of people. And then they start to, drain the sea because they couldn't catch the fish. And they assume that Hamas will be drained as well because they are the people, they're among the people. So the strategy in this three-tiered military assault on Gaza, which has not achieved its objectives yet, the strategy is genocide. Uh, and we need to see it for what it is. The hospitals are key to that because without the hospitals, there's no way of anyone getting treatment unless they go out to Egypt.
You know, Max, um, on your point about uh, Hamas's fighting capabilities, I'm wondering if you saw this quote from uh, Giora Island, who's a yeah. retired major general, former head of Israel's National Security Council. He said, from a professional point of view, I must give credit to their resilience. I cannot see any signs of collapse of the military abilities of Hamas, nor in their political strength to continue to lead Gaza. Yeah, that's Giora Island, who is a former major general very high ranking figure in the Israeli military who's now at the Israeli state sponsored think tank, think tank, the Institute for um, national security studies. And he's the guy who, by the way, recommended that Israel create not only famine, but spawn disease um, across Gaza to force the population to leave. Um, but, you know, I mean, you, you, you get candor from these characters and he is acknowledging that Hamas cannot be military, militarily defeated. It can't be confronted head on. But if you understand who Giora Eland is, um, I mean, this is someone who's always recommended dis disproportionate force against civilians. Then you understand he's not calling for an end to the war or a ceasefire. He's calling for an intensification of the war against civilians. Um, but you know, at the same time, you have this acknowledgement that wasn't present before among key veterans, like the highest ranking figures in the Israeli military elite, that the objective of eradicating Hamas or defeating Hamas as the US as and the Biden administration understand it is delusional. Here's Dan Halutz, the former Israeli army chief of staff, former um, head of the Israeli air force. He, he says that Israel has lost the war against Hamas in Gaza. He means they've lost the military war. And he said that the real victory will be the removal of Netanyahu, who uh, there's a consensus within the Israeli military intelligence apparatus, the military elite that Netanyahu is at fault for October 7th and for this failure and they want him out. Um. Here's one more. This is yeah. Michael Michael Milstein, former senior yeah. Israeli intelligence officer, uh, criticizing statements from Israeli leaders that Hamas is at a breaking point. He said, quote, they've been saying this for a while that Hamas is collapsing, but it's just not true. Every day we're facing tough battles. Yeah. Um, and the question is, how much longer can Israel go attempting to implement this three-tiered plan while it's taking so many casualties in the Gaza Strip. This is a very casualty adverse society. I always make the point that Israel pioneered UAV, unmanned aerial vehicle, drone technology, because it could not withstand casualties. This started during the Lebanon invasion, the, when it inter, entered the Lebanese civil war. Um, it, disrupts Israeli politics and Israeli society too much to take hundreds of casualties. They're now well over the 160 mark and they're hiding casualties for sure. Um, many of the casualties they're hiding are people on the verge of death on Israel in Israeli hospitals, which have the highest level of technology and are keeping likely hundreds of men barely alive. Um, you have wounded, you have now a, su a suicide plague, among the Israeli military, among the reservists. Um, you see reports of Israeli reservists who have lost their businesses, their small businesses, and have been reduced to poverty because they've been in the field for so long and can't go back to work. So this puts increasing pressure on a society that values a middle-class Western lifestyle. And then you have Avigdor Lieberman today, uh, former long-serving right-wing Israeli military uh, minister, uh, sort of the head of the Russian Israeli longtime political leader of the Russian Israeli public complaining that 200,000 Israelis are displaced from their homes and have no way to go back. Um, the Israeli government just announced that the residents of Sterot will be paid basically to live in hotels outside their city. Um, and will have to exist on welfare because they can't go home anytime soon. Uh, in the north, it's 100,000 people who can't go home. And the strikes by Hezbollah are increasing. So Israel's borders have been in, kind of shifted. And this is just 
the political crisis is just beginning. Uh, meanwhile, and I think this needs to be acknowledged um, by the U.S. media, the U.S. mainstream media. That New York Times article, I don't know what you thought of it, Aaron, but I thought it was, is pretty weak uh, compared to what we're seeing from the Al-Qassam brigades, the armed wing of Hamas. Um, but they're not acknowledging, they're not really describing what it looks like uh, in the field for the Israeli military. Uh, and I wanted to show a recent video of Al-Qassam achievements. I think if I play it with no volume, uh, it won't have any uh, impact on our already suppressed reach. Whoops, volume came on. But this is something that I think, and Aaron, I'd like to get your thoughts on whether this is just uh, anecdotal evidence of Israel Israeli losses or this is something more systemic. But here is a Al Qassam fighter in Shujaya striking an Israeli Merkava tank with a Yassin 105 rocket propelled grenade, which is a tandem, has a tandem charge uh, to specifically penetrate tanks. That's another hit. And these videos are just coming out day after day, showing Israeli soldiers taking casualties, showing tanks being hit. And yes, they're actually being destroyed. This is, um, this, this, these words you see, are um, is were written on a wall by these Qassam fighters in an, a destroyed house in Shujaia, and it says, "From here, we uh, destroyed three armored vehicles and killed a soldier." And they're doing that to say to show the Israeli forces that they were there and that they left and that they survived the attack. These are not martyrdom operations. These are okay. Now here you see they're targeting. Israeli forces who are bunkered in a home that they're occupying, which once belonged to a Palestinian family. And those red arrows signify casualties would about who are about to be casualties. And they hit them with, I think, this may be a, a, not a weapon that hadn't been rolled out yet, which is a thermobaric weapon designed to hit pillboxes and bunkers. Did a massive amount of destruction there. Um, Israel announced something like six casualties the day after these attacks, which you see. Now, here are 10 soldiers. There, you can see one soldier is actually filming on his phone. He's like filming for TikTok or something. Let's go back. And they have no idea that they're being watched. There he is. He's just filming. Hmm. They're saying, you know, we hit 10 soldiers in this strike. Uh, certainly there are casualties, heavy casualties there. Here's another strike on a Merkava tank. Um, they're calling it in. You can see they operate through non-encrypted lines. This shows you the kind of cellular structure of the Al-Qassam brigades. They operate in small teams independently of one another. They often bring uh, someone who is a spotter who uses just a common DSLR camera. And... Here's another Israeli soldier caught bunkering. They basically have nothing to do and nowhere to go there. And they're just kind of hold, the Israelis are just forced to simply hold territory, which makes them sitting ducks. They have no, they don't know where to look for Hamas targets. They only know how to carry out field execution. So they're preparing the Yassin 105 RPG, which has armor piercing rounds. Their small arms fire, and they have clearly struck their target and done enormous amounts of structural damage and likely caused casualties. Now, here's a grenade attack on Israeli soldiers who are just milling around in the streets of Shujaia, where they said they had an operational hold. And there's the rescue team, which 
receives small arms fire. And you can see the stretcher where they were evacuating a soldier, which they were using to evacuate a soldier, was left on the ground in haste as they ran away. Um, and the reason you're able to see this is the Qassam team that carried out this attack brought back, brought their footage back. They survived. They went back to base. Again, it's, these are not martyrdom operations. And they often take the equipment that you see there from Israeli soldiers and use it in the field again. They're also using unexploded munitions that are dropped on the Gaza Strip, uh, creating, for example, the Shawaz bomb, which is kind of like a TV bomb that's placed by hand at the weakest point of Merkava tanks. You can easily find video of uh, Qassam fighters doing that, just delivering by hand a giant bomb to the back of a Merkava tank, which is the weakest, most vulnerable point, because that's where um, the... Uh, Israeli soldiers will enter and leave the tank. So the door is there. Um, yeah, this is so this is a military crisis for Israel. And I don't know, what are your thoughts, Aaron, on where this is going? Well, it just makes sense to me that the occupying power, as happens to all occupiers, gets sort of drunk on its own power, uh, filled with contempt and dehumanization for the people it's occupying and so it can't fathom that they could possibly effectively resist with armed force but uh, as even israeli officials that we've quoted are admitting hamas is inflicting damage and uh this this just seems to be a pattern i i'm you just reading about vietnam there was a similar attitude that, like how could these villagers in huts uh you know go up against the most powerful military in the world and Vietnam, even though it was destroyed, it did hold out. And um, this footage to me underscores that we're seeing a similar dynamic here. I mean, you know, I, the problem is I just can't help but think about, I mean, again, who does Israel punish for its losses? It punishes the civilians of Gaza. Um, who did it punish after October 7th? The civilians of Gaza, which, which it always does. And, um, but it's true. Looking at that, if if that footage there is representative of what Israel is facing, it's a the question as you raised is how long can they continue this for? Because obviously there's no pressure on them coming from Biden. That's not a factor here. It just isn't. They have carte blanche. But sustaining casualties does impose a cost, and uh, Israel can't sustain that. It seems so. Um, yeah, that's that's just fascinating footage to watch. It's, it's incredible to get that to get that look at what's happening on the ground. Yeah, there's new footage out today, uh, also on Al Qassam channels. Uh, you can follow a mirrored Telegram account and see all of it, or there, are, you know, resistance related accounts on Twitter where you can just see it all. But I think the U.S. media needs to show this to the American public to show what they are paying for and the failures in the field. Of course, they didn't do this with the Ukrainian military at all. Uh, they didn't show us the counteroffensive that we knew would fail. So who can expect them to do this? Um, they didn't show us the US military failing in Afghanistan miserably during the surge and after with a completely fake Afghan army. So who can expect that? Honestly, the US media showed more of what was taking place in Vietnam through Walter Cronkite yeah. And Dan yeah. rather than they are now. And it's why they're so discredited because everyone is watching these on social media. Everyone. I mean, I talked to an old timer in DC, a foreign policy old timer who's in his seventies, who's telling me how he's watching all these Kassam videos and he's just blown away. And I learned about these in 2014, only when I went to Gaza hmm. because, uh, you know, they were broadcasting them on TV. Everyone was talking about them. Um, the spokesman for the Al Qassam brigades, Abu Obeda, would appear and show highlights and announce how many vehicles had been attacked. This was, you know, Israel had pulled out by the time I got in and they were just doing aerial attacks. But at that point, Twitter was not as video friendly. It was very difficult to publish video on Twitter. Social media just wasn't quite ready to accommodate this kind of GoPro footage. Um, and now we've reached a point where, at least on Twitter X, it's free enough. I mean, the censorship is still coming back, but it's free enough 
and the uh, the video compatibility is so strong that I think the international public can really get a sense of what's happening on the ground in a way they hadn't before. And I follow uh, Hebrew Israeli language accounts, which publish GoPros from Israeli uh, soldiers' helmets. And often they'll show themselves rescuing a buddy in the field to show their valor and their bravery. They're not showing them, this is the thing, you'll never, or I don't know when you're going to see them confronting Qassam militants face to face in the same way. Uh, you'll see them blowing up buildings on the official IDF accounts, but the soldiers will publish this footage of them rescuing their wounded buddies. And the footage is horrible. I mean, it looks like Vietnam footage from uh, one of the Vietnam films you know, you, that might have come out in the 1980s, just bloody guys laying around screaming for help. And then they have to be immediately medevaced and the helicopter comes in and they're taken off to a hospital in Tel Aviv. Uh, so how long can this go on is, is, is the question. How quickly can they get genocide done? What preponderance of intervening forces can prevail on Israel to slow down their genocidal march. We're going to know that in the next two to four weeks. And that's for sure. And meanwhile, Max, can I ask you what's happening on the other front? So the West Bank, I know this week Israel increased its attacks there. Uh, I know some yeah. soldiers have recently even been, been wounded there. And there's also the border with Lebanon where there's still, you know, Israel has been making new threats to Lebanon that unless you deal with Hezbollah, we're going to deal with Hezbollah, which I don't know how Israel would do that because Hezbollah actually can fight back. But um, what do you make of those two areas, the West Bank and the uh, the border with Lebanon? Well, you have two major battlefronts in the in the West Bank. Well, the major battlefronts in the north, that's the area that the PA fails to control. Tulkarim, the city of Tulkarim, uh, is a major battlefront where forces that co cohered around a non-partisan sort of non-aligned organization called the Lion's Den uh, in 2021, uh, 2022, which started confronting the Israeli military directly there. Nablus and Janine uh, are continuing to fight every day and the Israeli military is sending in more and more forces. They sent in the largest number of soldiers yet um, into Janine. I think 3,000 went in the other day for raids, this week for raids. And those Palestinian resistance fighters are using not only small arms, which are not as easily available in the West Bank, but they're also employing the Shawaz bomb that I mentioned before, which are hand-placed IEDs um, I think they're much more sophisticated in the Gaza Strip using armor piercing, armor piercing nails and so on. Um, but they're placing them in front of bulldozers and tanks, and they have been causing casualties among Israeli soldiers there. And so Israel this week, uh, through its war cabinet, designated five money exchange centers in West Bank cities, including Ramallah, as terrorist organizations. And they believe that the money there is being used by those resistance fighters to purchase weapons on the black market. They just can't crush them. They can't get them down. And so they raided them, ambushed them through uh, with you know special forces Yamam teams, killed employees, killed people who fought back, and stole $3 million in cash from these Palestinian money exchange shops in Ramallah, and I believe there were some raids in Nablus. So Israel is conducting piracy across the West Bank. Meanwhile, in the rural areas, as our contributor Jeremy Lafredo documented, the Israeli settlers continue to carry out their own genocidal assault on the weakest links within the Palestinian population there, the rural villages that rely on farming, shepherding, and they have ethnically cleansed dozens of villages Jeremy showed how people were forced to live in caves because their village had been so terrorized that they could no longer live there. Others are, you know, others are just on the verge of breaking. This is all happening under the watch of the of a democratic 
government in Washington, which claims with capital D Democrat, which claims to support the two state solution. And we've also, we're also seeing images out of the Armenian quarter in Jerusalem, in the old city of Armenians coming under violent assault by fanatical Israeli settlers uh, and being driven out of their own quarter. They want to establish a new Jewish quarter in the Armenian quarter, these fanatical cultists who believe in the third temple are doing this. And where is Washington? And JFK, John F. Kennedy proposed that the old city and Jerusalem itself be an international city. Um, and here you have the Biden administration just letting all of this take place day after day, not even in the Gaza Strip, but in the Armenian quarter. There's no Hamas there. Um, you know, Biden uh, early on in in his presidency, he said something about how basically until Israel's neighbors recognize its right to exist, there will not be peace. Basically, was threatening continued state terror against the Palestinians and everybody else until they all recognize Israel's so-called right to exist. Why should anybody have to affirm the right to exist of this insane state? that is hell-bent on killing everybody that's not in its own ethnic group. It's just such an insane demand. And, th and that's a demand that guarantees there will never be any peace because you know, people have the right to exist. They don't have the right to exist, especially if their existence is premised on destroying everyone else's existence. Um, and so Biden is complicit in all this and they've decided they, they're gonna just, you know, it doesn't matter to them. Even though Biden's approval ratings now are the lowest uh, of any modern presidency heading into a tough election, that Gallup just put that out. They don't care that that's how committed he is to to Israeli dominance. Yeah, I mean, what they don't have it shows they don't have a right to exist. I mean, first of all, states, countries, they don't have rights like individuals do. That's just phony. So Israel's right to self defense. These are just phony talking points. But when, when they say Israel's right to exist, they don't mean a right to exist. They mean a right to exist as a Jewish exclusivist apartheid state. Yeah. The, the Palestinian Liberation Organization in 1988, ahead of, sorry, in 1990, uh, ahead of the Madrid talk, talks, the beginning of the failed and calamitous peace process, recognized Israel's right to exist, but they would not recognize Israel's right to exist as a Jewish state. Why? Because, well, just within Israel's 1948 borders, to the extent they even exist, there are some 1.5 to 2 million Palestinian citizens who would whose uh, rights would be formally subjugated if the Palestinian Authority representing its Palestinians before the world were to recognize Israel as a so-called Jewish state. And then you have like these Zionist supremacists on mainstream networks like Jake Tapper, who constantly bring this up. They won't even recognize, Hamas doesn't recognize Israel's right to exist. Jake Tapper would not recognize the United States right to exist as a white Christian nation because he's yeah. Jewish. Neither would I. Um, it would be it would mean that we'd be second class citizens formally so that's what it all that's sort of what this comes down to all of the rights that israel's demanding are not going to be obtained through negotiation they're fighting right now for their right to exist as an exclusivist jewish state through genocide because they yep. realize that's the only way they can achieve it yeah um, meanwhile yeah. Here, here's just some more news from today for the second time, the Biden administration is bypassing Congress to funnel wow. more weapons to Israel. This is the second time they've done that this month. Uh, this just came out this afternoon on Friday, December 29th. Does it say which weapons? Or? It is uh, a $147.5 million sale for equipment, including fuses, charges, and chargers, and primers that is needed to make the shells that Israel has already purchased. So to uh, support the tank shells that Israel fires into hospitals and schools and homes. The Biden administration is, again, for the second time, bypassing congressional oversight. Uh, under the grounds that this is a so-called national security emergency. That's the premise of, of this action that Biden's taking. 
Yeah, and you now have leading Democrats uh, who are not affiliated with the squad, like Joaquin Castro, who was uh, might have been the head of the House Foreign Relations Committee if the Democrats were in charge. He's called for a ceasefire. You have um, Gregory Meeks, who's always been a tool of the Israel lobby, not calling for a ceasefire. He's someone who's also sort of a senior Democrat on House Foreign Affairs. He's uh, uh, criticized the Biden administration for rejecting congressional oversight. That's pretty much the best this tool can do, but it's something. Uh, lesser known figures not affiliated with the squad, uh, Mark Takano, who uh, is a progressive representing the uh, Riverside area and the Inland Empire in California, which has a very high military enlistment rate and does have a substantial uh, Republican population. He's called for a ceasefire. So the calls are emerging for a ceasefire. Biden's empire of lies is falling apart. As uh, we've seen in a recent Gallup poll, Biden is historically unpopular heading into re-election. And it appears that the Democrats are hitting for a major disaster at the ahead of the Democratic convention. I mean, what do you see happening there, Aaron? Well, I mean, I don't understand what goes on inside this administration. They must see the polls. They must see that his approval ratings at this um, significant low. Uh, running against Trump, who is not popular outside of his base, but yet even in the younger demographic, even among young people, which, which the Democrats should be sweeping, Trump right is currently more popular than Biden. And I think this comes down to just these the people who run this world are just, uh, you know, from Washington are just so fundamentally committed to hegemony and supremacy that not, they can't see anything else. So they can't see peaceful alternatives. Uh, they can't see negotiating with Hamas. Back when Hamas was moderating its position and actually trying to um, uh, allow some kind of peaceful accommodation with Israel tacitly, they wouldn't even tolerate that. They instead just tried to destroy Hamas and uh, make the people of Gaza suffer with the blockade. Um, after October 7th, rather than negotiating with Hamas for a negotiated release of the of hostages, both Palestinians, thousands of them in Israeli prisons, and the Israelis that were taken to Gaza, they just backed this genocidal assault. So they just can't see anything but hegemony. And even if that means undermining their own election chances, I just don't think they care. That's a great point. It reminds me of a uh, conversation I had coming out of a State Department briefing in October with a senior member of the press who gets access in, to the bullpen. It's just been there for years. And they said to me, you know, I actually kind of feel sorry for the Biden State Department because they're in this bind. Um, they see that Israel is carrying out this exterminationist rampage in Gaza. I mean, those weren't their words, but basically to that effect, but they can't do anything about it. That's what we keep hearing. They don't have leverage. And what he meant was that they're trapped between their base, you know, the small D democratic base, the people that they're supposed to represent their actual constituents, especially the, their emerging base among a very multicultural, diverse future America, that, that's what the Democrats play on, and the donor class that has paid for Joe Biden's career, a very mediocre character who lied his way to the top, who is unbelievably corrupt, and a, a, a donor base which has contributed through the Israel lobby at least $10 million to Joe Biden's campaigns, making him the largest recipient of any active U.S. politician of Israel lobby funds. And that's who they're accountable to. I mean, it really shows what democracy in the U.S. is, is Biden's going to choose his donor base over this. He doesn't, you look at, you can look at um, uh, what's happening at Harvard University as a microcosm where Har the Harvard Corporation which is supposed to be accountable to the financial elite, has refused to hand over Claudine Gay, this pretty mediocre Harvard president uh, who got caught up in this 
uh, insane anti-Semitism hoax. They're refusing to hand her over as a sacrifice uh, to the pro-Israel lobby and the financial elite because it would set a terrible precedent. And she's the first black Harvard president. It would just look terrible. So they can't do it. So the, 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 the big donors, the billionaires like Bill Ackman, he's, I mean, follow his Twitter account. This guy has the IQ of a toaster oven, but he's extremely rich. He's a venture vulture capitalist at Pershing Square. So he has the power of Harvard alumni. He can, he's pulling $200 million out. He's building pressure with other donors. That's what would happen to Biden if he started pushing for a ceasefire is they would try to pull the plug on his campaign from the top. So what power do the people have to pull the plug on Biden's campaign from the bottom? Because Biden, he needs to be made an example of. We're going to see that in Chicago at the Democratic National Convention, 1968, Chicago. There were the riots outside, Richard Daley, Chicago mayor's police riot against protesters of the Vietnam War. They were shut out of the convention. The convention was a complete disaster. And uh, at that time, however, you had Bobby Kennedy Sr., who was running against the war, who'd basically co-opted Eugene McCarthy's positions, was assassinated. But you had Eugene McCarthy running. There's no uh, Eugene McCarthy was going to end Nixon's or campaigning to end Nixon's war. Joe, Bi this is Joe Biden's war, and this is Vietnam. This war on Gaza is Vietnam for the young activist base of the Democratic Party or for, would have been the base of the Democratic Party, the young activist progressive base of the U.S. This is Vietnam. You have Biden is Nixon. They're going into Chicago. Nixon was highly intelligent and devious. Biden is vacant. He stumbles around on stage. I heard someone describe him as like, he's like a, a Roomba vacuum cleaner bouncing around a room. Maybe he's the cat that sits on the Roomba. It's going to be a disaster. Uh, and it's possible that the convention will be uh, like, the, you see these activists shutting roads down around airports, which I don't think is a wise tactic. That could be taking place in Chicago. There's going to be massive police violence. It's going to be a disaster. Uh, yeah. And they deserve it. They deserve yeah. every bit of it. They deserve all of it. And what's their solution electorally? It's basically to try to get Trump removed from the ballot in states, as they already did yep. in Colorado. They just did that in Maine. Um, the, well, the Maine one's crazy. I mean, yeah. I mean, based on him taking, based on him inciting an insurrection that he, in fact, by the way, he never was even, and I don't care about defending Trump or getting into that because who cares, but he never was even charged with inciting an insurrection like jack smith the prosecutor overseeing all this could have charged him with that he didn't um so they're they're the biden administration they're so desperate as a result of biden's own policies and incompetence that they're basically their strategy now and, and that of the democratic party is to remove their main opponent via the most ridiculous arguments to get him removed from the ballot based on allegations that he's never even been charged of let alone convicted of yeah i kind of want to <laughs> the secretary of state of Maine just created a new law on her own and then just imp invoked it to remove Trump from the ballot. I mean, it doesn't matter because the Democrats always win Maine. Yeah. But uh, <laughs> what's her name? Shenna Bellows. And she, she, I mean, she it's a joke. AC, she used to be with the ACLU, I think. Or for or like involved in voting rights somehow. Um, but, you know, I, I don't think she's not a that. lawyer. Yeah. She's, she like is, is, she's one of these like pussy hat liberal clowns who wants publicity and wants to be like, um, on this, what was that lady Betsy? What's her name? It was one of the, remember these, these weird whistleblowers that came out of the agencies when Trump was first elected and they all became famous and we'd never heard of them before. Um, I can't even remember her name. Anyway, she she's I mean it's just a it's an absurd joke and it it contributes further to the mask lifting moment that we're living through where the empire of lies is being exposed because yeah. the whole the whole soft the, the the soft power that the Biden administration wants to project its its rationale for supporting Ukraine is always to defend democracy and that also used to be the rationale for def supporting Israel 
Um, now I don't even know what the rationale is. So Hamas is going to come and terrorize us on New Year's. I actually saw a local news report warning people not to go to New York because of possible lone wolf attacks inspired by Hamas. I mean, this is being pumped out by the Department of Home on Homeland Security. So I don't even know how they're going to, they've pretty much given up on pushing the defensive democracy. Yeah, that's done. Uh, same thing within Ukraine, how we're supposed to be defending democracy against autocracy. Now the Biden administration is outright saying, look how much money we're spending on domestic military production. 90% of the money we're spending on Ukraine goes to the states. And of course, in reality, it goes to uh, weapons profiteers. But even in Ukraine, they can't even sustain the, the talking point about democracy. Now it's literally, they're calling it bombonomics of just, this is good because we're buying bombs uh, from US producers. Oh, the mayor of Kiev or, or Kiev, Vitaly Klitschko, basically, it was like he had heard a gray, gray zone live stream or something and accused Zelensky of running an authoritarian police state, banning all his rivals and throwing everyone in jail. And he says, what, what democracy are we fighting for? I mean, that's the possible successor to Zelensky who runs the largest population center. So who is installed in the Maidan coup. So there you have it. What democracy, what's left for Samantha power to say, I mean, these R2P humanitarian interventionist liberal hovercraft elites have never been in a more intellectually hermetic atmosphere where just nobody believes what they have to say. No. Uh, and so the only thing left, because there isn't really a left in the United States, an anti-war left that can gain power, is Trump or someone like Trump, who's just an unsheathed militarist who said, yeah, well, we've had a lot of killers in the United States and you know, we just have to kill. We got to take their oil. We have to sell weapons uh, to Saudi Arabia because we need jobs. That's pretty much all that's left. So the mask is off. And October 7th was the ult, it, it brought forward the ultimate mask lifting moment for the US foreign policy elite. It's never coming back on. I could, I could talk about that for another hour, but uh, we got some other topics. Do you want to do uh, the New York Times and Nation or do you want to um, get past that? I think we should address it. We don't have to go too in depth, but it's worth addressing that um, after so many debunked Israeli claims, the dozens of beheaded babies, the baby burned in an oven, uh, the baby cut out of a woman's fetus, uh, or sorry, the, 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 the fetus cut out of the womb. Um, now Israel and its supporters are really doubling down on these claims of mass rape by militants on October 7th. And we pointed out a lot of the inconsistencies in those stories, but it persists. And the Biden administration has really tried to push it as well. Um, they've made a thing out of it. Hillary Clinton came out and made a thing out of it. CNN, Jake Tapper has tried to make a thing out of it. And now the New York Times has come out with a new story that people who buy into Israeli claims are really promoting um, that <coughs> making the claim that Hamas used sexual violence um as a uh tool of war that there, there was a deliberate effort to use sexual violence as a tool of war on october 7th but once again people are overlooking the countervailing evidence and the inconsistencies even inside this own story including the very quiet acknowledgement and this is what the, a lot of the story is about it's basically an elaborate effort to justify the fact that there's no physical evidence yeah and also no testimony still um yeah so that's what the story basically is screams without words um, I mean, that's a quote from a oh, I, uh, an eyewitness who actually wasn't an eyewitness. Um, but it's kind of like, we don't have the words, so we're just going to hear the screams anyway by, by generating enough innuendo to make you believe that this actually took place. And you really have to harbor a lot of... Uh, academics would call it Orientalist anti-Arab racism to believe that all this was true. You, I mean, this really, this, this narrative, it's like the central park five for pantsuit feminists and pussy hat liberals. 
who think that Arab men are just like these savages who could actually storm into another country or a storm through some, uh, you know, some border in a military operation and just stop in the middle of an intense confrontation with a powerful military and stand in a circle around a woman and start gang raping her and cutting her breasts off and playing with them. Because those are the testimonies contained in this article. But as you said, Aaron, the article by Jeffrey Gettleman, who is just like notorious for these kinds of pieces about Africa and other places, uh, it blames the lack of forensic evidence, the complete absence of any forensic evidence on Jewish burial rituals. Basically, the Jews bury their dead too quickly in 24 hours. So we just couldn't get at any of these bodies. So we're just going to go off of all these weird testimonies from dubious individuals who were supplied to Jeffrey Gettleman and Anat Schwartz and Adam Sella by the Israeli government. Because this is not Me Too. Me Too was like a fairly organic thing. Maybe there'd be a group of like three or five women who would get together in a workplace to accuse the boss. But this is a statewide conspiracy to justify a genocidal assault on an occupied people as international support falters. And it happened two months. It really cohered two months after the assault began. So I don't know. Do you want to go through some of the key claims here? Or how should we do this? Well, yeah, let's do it. Let's do it. Um, All right. Well, um, it's, it starts out with the woman in the black dress. In the grainy video, you can see her lying on her back, dress torn, leg spread, vagina exposed. I mean, they always, they, they just throw that in there and it immediately does something to your mind to make you think that she must have been raped. And they don't show you the photo. But the photo, it's a woman who is searching for a missing friend at the site of the rape. It was shot by someone who is searching for a friend. And the video went viral and it depicts Gal Abdush, uh, who is attending the Nova Electronic Music Festival. And you know, they they use the term as the terrorists closed in on her. So they're they're using Israeli language. Um she sent one final message. You don't understand. Okay. And then the New York times verified the video evidence based largely on the video and verified by the New York times. So, so what? So the video of her was real. Like no one can test that. So your verification is irrelevant, but they're trying to say we verified she was raped. They're trying to suggest that, but they never yeah. verified anything. The Israeli police said she be they believe she was the Israeli police is a highly politicized institution, deeply ingrained in the Israeli military. And the Israeli police was engaged in confrontations with Hamas gunmen on October 7. Um, and look at their how professional they are. They're so professional that they made a forensic examination and said they believe someone was raped based on video alone, grainy video. That's all it took for them. Yeah. So they have no credibility. And then they go on to, to basically do this long explanation for why there's no forensic evidence. Yeah. And one of the explanations comes from this group, Zaka, which, as you've reported at the Gray Zone, are frauds. They've They're been frauds. caught lying multiple times. And they yeah, even they have even, a, have they a even sexual Yossi Lando. They cite Yossi Lando, the guy who made yeah. up the – who confirmed the beheaded baby story and – cooked up the uh, fetus cut out of the woman that never happened. But back to this woman, Abdush. I mean, I wrote about this in my piece on October 7th and Friendly Fire. If you actually look at the video, her car has been destroyed. She has burns like from an explosion on her head and her body has rigor mortis, which is why her legs are spread. It's a very typical posture for someone who has rigor mortis to be in and she fell out of her car because of the explosion so she may have been killed by hamas gunmen we're not di disputing that possibility they did have rpgs they were shooting at people who were fleeing the electronic music festival she also may have been killed by a hellfire missile her husband 
was killed separately and was burned to a crisp, which suggests he was killed by an Israeli Apache helicopter. Um, but there's no, there, there's no proof of rape here. And that, that's like the key story that they have at the top. Then we, we move down. Okay. Then we got all these cars that, I mean, these are roasted cars. A lot of them could have been, there are Israeli tanks and Apache helicopters operating in the area. We don't know what happened. Um, okay. The Israeli, we'll go through the whole thing. The Times viewed a video provided by the Israeli media showing two dead Israeli soldiers at a base near Gaza who appeared to have been shot directly in their vaginas. That is not proof of anything. They may have been shot in other parts of their bodies, but uh, Israeli soldiers were shot on base. These were active duty soldiers in uniform who were enforcing the siege of the open air prison of Gaza. And many of them were women. The Israeli military puts women on base because that's their policy of full conscription. That doesn't prove that there was a policy of sexually targeting or gender-based violence. It proves there was a policy of attacking soldiers. Yep. They, yeah. And there's a line in there about uh, someone had nails driven into their groin. Uh, yeah. There's one line in there about that. There's no more details provided. Um, and that could be evidence of a really brutal crime, a really sadistic one. But yeah. it's not rape. And we need a actual details to be able to form a conclusion, including an independent investigation and at minimum forensic evidence, which there is none, which basically this article goes to great lengths to justify the fact that there is none. Uh, they talk about the chaos of the aftermath of October 7th and Jewish tradition says you have to bury the dead quickly yeah, um, yeah. and that some evidence was accidentally destroyed. It's basically a one long like, oops, we actually, oops, we didn't mean to. Uh, destroy the evidence, but we did. Oh, well. They were not focused on collecting semen samples from women's bodies, requesting autopsies, or closely examining crime scenes. At that moment, the authorities said they were intent on repelling Hamas and identifying the dead. Well, maybe there were no semen samples on women's bodies. Like, why is Jeffrey Gettleman presuming that that was there? Like, oh, well, there's all this semen all over the place, but we're just going to throw the bodies away because we have to bury them. Like, do you really think that that would have taken place? I'm sorry to laugh, but it's so ridiculous. I mean, if if rape happened, then obviously uh, the, it would be paramount to collect forensic evidence. And Hamas was repelled w w within what twenty four hours, like on October eighth well, and less. 9th. Yeah, was Hamas. So yeah. on October eighth, you could have taken all these samples, uh, and they're just trying to come up. I'm sorry to laugh because it's not funny, but it's but the logic here. It's so it's so transparently ridiculous that it's comical. It is, and they're going to great lengths to put forward a case that is not supported by by any, by any evidence here. And why are they doing this? Because they need some kind of talking point to justify their barbarism in Gaza right now. That's what all this is is in the service of. They have not put a number on how many women were raped, saying that most are dead and buried, and they will never know. No survivors have spoken publicly. And they say they've identified some supposed survivor in a mental hospital, but they won't furnish her. For the to first you. time, this is the <laughs> first time that I've seen, and if anybody has other evidence to the contrary, I'll correct myself, but this is the first time I've seen anyone claim that there actually are survivors of sexual assault on October 7th. Before that, it was always ambiguous. Like, we don't know if there are survivors or not. So far, we, we haven't identified any, but there could be. Now, all of a sudden, the New York Times has magically uncovered four people, it says, but uh, it says survive sexual assault. But as you said, Max, none of them are willing to talk, not to not to police, not to the media. So why so, even mention it? I mean, I, I wouldn't do that if I just heard from a criminally mendacious government that some may exist somewhere in a, yeah. uh, a mental health center, uh, but I can't talk to them that wouldn't rot like at, from an editorial standpoint that wouldn't rise to the level of evidence. Yeah. And this is um, journalistic malpractice. This is, this is the, the worst journalism at this discredited newspaper of record. And we're just going to keep ripping yeah. this piece to shreds. Um, Oh, here <laughs> a combination of chaos, enormous grief and Jewish religious duties meant that many bodies were buried as quickly as possible. So if you question why they don't have any forensic evidence, you're anti-Semitic. 
Exactly. You're questioning yeah. Jewish religious duties. Yes. yes. And most, and then in the next line, most were never examined. Um, so you want us to accept all these claims while also acknowledging that most of the corpses were never even examined. And then it says uh, 360 people were slaughtered in a few hours. The bodies were hauled away by the truckload. Okay, you are a dupe. I mean, you don't even, it just shows how superficial the Jeffrey Gettleman's understanding of what happened on and after October 7th was because the bodies that were hauled away by the truckload were those of people from Gaza, including Hamas militants who had been killed by Apache helicopters. And is they, they did not throw truckloads of Jewish corpses together and just haul them away. They were individually taken away in body bags uh, by groups like Zaka. So that 360 num number also includes people from Gaza who were killed inside Israel on October 7th. Okay, so they're at a loss to fully explain what happened to their loved ones in the final moment. In their yeah, final moments, you... but we're going to just give you a yeah. bunch of innuendo anyway. And why would you be at a loss to fully explain what happened? Uh, if you're sure that Hamas killed these people and even raped some of them, which is what you're telling us now, then why are you at a loss to explain it to the families? Uh, if you can explain it to us, why can't you explain it to the families? Because they're coming up with a story. And I think what that line indicates is actually not only do they not have evidence of sexual assault, but actually they don't want to tell the families that Israel killed some of those people, some of those Israelis who died. That's why they're at a loss to explain it. Yeah. We're at a loss to explain what happened to, um, what's her name? Miss Abdush, because she may have been killed by a hellfire missile. She was, her car was destroyed. She was badly burned and she had rigor mortis. And we're just going to say she was, we're just going to tell you she was raped because she was dressed uh, in, scantily clad because that's how people dress at raves uh in the desert where it's hot and you're dancing all night but we're just going to tell you that hamas militants ripped their clothes off even though we have no evidence whatsoever okay now they have like some testimony from someone named sapir who is a 24 year old accountant who has become one of israeli police's key witnesses Okay, so this is one of the key witnesses here, but we don't know who they are. We can't check their identity. They can't be questioned by other media. She doesn't want to be fully identified because she'll, she says she'll be hounded for the rest of her life if her last name were revealed. This is absurd testimony, uh, and, it's, and I will discredit it easily. Um, so she attended the rave. She was hiding. She said she was shot in the back, so she was faint. Um, so after she was shot in the back and hiding, we, we can't examine her injury, by the way, or even know for sure that she was shot in the back. But all of this testimony comes based on her recollection after being shot in the back. She saw motorcycles and trucks and about 100 men, uh, dark sweatsuits, and they get in and they congregate along the road with assault rifles, grenades, and... And they congregate around badly wounded woman, women. It was like an assembly point. And she saw a young woman with copper colored hair, her pants pushed down to her knees and a man made her bend over and they started to rape her. And every time she flinched, they plunged a knife into her back. Okay. This is in the middle of an intense situation where they're the Hamas militants are supposed to collect as many captives as they can and get back into Gaza as quickly as possible. They have instructions to do this. This is a, a political imperative. And they achieved that goal largely while Israeli forces were in mobilizing to advance. Uh, but in the middle of all this, they had time to do this, shred a woman into pieces. Well, one terrorist raped her. They don't say Hamas militants, they say terrorist. Well, one terrorist raped her Another pulled out a box cutter and sliced off her breast. And according to Sapir, one continues to rape her and the other throws her breast to someone else and they play with it, throw it, and it falls on the road. So they're playing with body parts. It's so obvious. I mean, does anyone believe this? 
does anybody does the New York Times reporter who wrote this article really believe that that they're pl- they're passing it around like uh, yeah and, and if so did they ever recover this I'm sorry to be so graphic they're just such savages they're just yeah they're just so crazy that they did anybody they ever time- re- did anybody yeah. ever recover this body part that was sliced off and played with and so therefore has the DNA of the of these savage terrorists that were doing that it's so obvious what's going on here I'm not afraid to call it out. They're playing on these ridiculous, insane, racist stereotypes of savage Muslim men coming up with the most ridiculous stories, and they rightfully expect a liberal, educated New York Times audience to believe this um, and the New York Times to put this out there because people have such racism embedded in them that they're not going to question stuff like this. But I'm sorry, we are. It's just so ridiculous. It's and so here's how we know that Sapir is a fraud. She saw three other women raped and terrorists carrying the severed heads of three more women. Okay, the names of the dead are known. Their identities are known. It's all official now. They're, you can see them all at Haaretz. And they've been uh, examined by forensic pathologists. And there hasn't been any documentation of one single woman who was decapitated with a knife. There were no decapitations recorded. So this is how you know that she's a fraud and that Jeffrey Gettleman is a fraud because Jeffrey Gettleman should have been able to cross-check the forensic evidence that was available based on the recorded deaths and know what we know and what everyone else knows. They're just so sloppy at the New York Times and they're so racist that they just want to believe this. Uh, but this is th- that's the end of Sapir, the key police witness. You're done. Uh, Yura Karal, the 22-year-old security consultant, was Sapir's friend who hid in the same spot. And they were part of a group of friends who met up at the party. Um, and he, he said he barely lifted his head to look at the road. But he also described seeing a woman raped and killed, even though he barely lifted his head. By the way, what does security consultant mean? Was he a security consultant for like the like to guard like a, a rave, or is he like is security consultant mean he's like an Israeli government uh, security state contractor? Um, yeah, I mean, I'd well, be curious, there, to, I'd be curious to know. Yeah. Well, here's a here's Roz Cohen, who is another key eyewitness who is a security contractor identified as a security contractor. He's actually a mercenary who is in a special forces unit in the Israeli military uh, who trains the notorious, the, 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 the uh, renowned human rights uh, friendly f- soldiers of the Democratic Republic of Congo. And uh, he was hiding in a stream bed and he describes, you know, graphic, a graphic scene of seeing a young naked woman um, being raped by men standing in a half circle and just seeing them penetrate her. And I remember her voice screams without words. Then one raises a knife and he's and slaughtered her. Okay. Um, very, very detailed, specific testimony from this Israeli army veteran, um, Roz Cohen. And we, we recognized Roz Cohen because he had been, um, delivered some of the first testimony. I think Roz Cohen delivered the first claims of Hamas rape at a time when Israeli media had not yet reported it. He d- delivered that to US media. But Roz Cohen's first interview was on October 9th. He had gone to the Nova Electronic Music Festival and uh, and, and we're going to we're going to hear his testimony. He and this is very revealing. Not even a minute passed and gunfire began on the road. We ran from under the stage and took cover there. After some time, someone yelled, the terrorists were coming. We sprinted away from there where they were shooting at us. I saw people simply falling. Someone got shot in the leg and fell on the ground. I felt like we were on the shooting range. This is all like fairly like legitimate. We got into the creek. In the creek, we saw some bushes and hid there. And like, this is video that he took. So they were taking video. There were so many terrorists around us and luckily they didn't see us from that bush. We saw so many people being slaughtered with knives and the screams. 
We were there for six or seven hours waiting for a rescue. The Israeli army found us, blah, blah, blah. Okay. He didn't say anything about seeing anyone raped. And he gave an interview also to I-24, the Israeli foreign ministry sponsored network that same day where he also delivered the same testimony and said absolutely nothing about rape. Then, and let me just say, that's, that's the that's the basic. See, if the New York Times did its job, what it would do is it would take whatever he told them, and then cross check them as you've just done with it, with his other public statements. Yeah, and they would have been forced to actually to conclude that this guy is lying, um, or at least that his statements are contradicted by what else he said publicly. But that's yeah. the minimal journalistic step among many that the New York Times did not do that you just demonstrated right there. Yes. And so and that's what you're supposed to do. You're supposed to express skepticism about your sources, especially when they are connected to a state that is engaged in an international propaganda campaign to justify its genocidal rampage on Gaza through atrocity exhibition. Uh, here is Roz Cohen as his testimony develops. The following day, he's interviewed by U.S. media, PBS, and he says, we go to hide in a bush, a big bush in a creek, and we was in the bush something like six or seven hours. A lot of terrorists go around us and search for people to kill. The terrorists, people from Gaza, raped girls. And after they raped them, they killed them, murdered them with knives, or the opposite, killed, and after they raped, they, they did that. They laughed. They always laughed. I can't forget how they laughed. Okay, this is again at a time when no Israeli media had reported any rape taking place on October 7th. No one exa who examined the bodies had said anything. So what's going on here? He actually accuses, first of all, he said it could be not Hamas. I mean, he keeps talking about knives. The Hamas militants were using Kalashnikovs, maybe RPGs, maybe grenades. They didn't need knives to kill people. So he, what is he talking about? Like riffraff that came in from, from Gaza? There were, there were riffraff that came in um, who killed people. I, I believe that to be true. They burst through the fence and some people just came in and were like onlookers. Um, but we don't know who he's talking about. But the, he actually accuses them of necrophilia. He doesn't say he saw anything. It's sort of a vague recollection. And it differs from the testimony he gave to the New York Times. And then following that testimony, Roz Cohen, from October 11th to the New York Times interview, he totally disappeared. He didn't give another testimony. So what mm -hmm. clearly happened was that when Israel decided that they needed to go with this Hamas mass rape thing to justify the assault on Gaza, as international support was flagging, and as the uh, base of Joe Biden, which includes many feminists and progressives, was turning on them, they searched out Roz Cohen again, and he was coached. And they gave him, they told him to give a more specific graphic testimony to the New York Times. And he did that. And he just updated testimony, which for some reason during the real period of trauma, he didn't provide to any Israeli media at all. So this guy's a fraud. It's just pretty obvious. And Jeffrey Gettleman, again, major journalistic malpractice, not checking the clear, the, all you have to do is, you know, you can look look for this, Google it in English and Hebrew, and you'll find uh, that uh, Roz Cohen had spoken before and delivered very dramatically different testimonies over time. Um, and so when you have alleged witnesses giving conflicting and transparently ridiculous te uh, testimony, then you have to then... Uh, be skeptical of every claim that you're being you're being given by the Israeli government, which is the conduit for all these claims. Um, and the New York Times has none of that. And unfortunately, so many people who uh, you know have a record of challenging outlets like the New York Times and raising questions because this allegation is so sensitive. Uh, it's not easy to raise questions about sexual assault allegations. It's just it's just not. It's it's really uncomfortable. It's awkward discussing it, but because of all that, people are just accepting this New York Times story like it, it's being spoon fed to them without raising the basic questions that you've just raised here and demonstrated with the available evidence 
that this one key witness is a fraud, is a complete fraud. And if the key witness is a fraud, then that raises questions about every other piece of so-called reporting that the New York Times is doing here. And um, you you combine that with the ridiculous stories that play into the stereotypes of Muslim men that racists have um, with the lack of forensic evidence. And you have all these convenient excuses for that. You have to then fundamentally question the premise of this story. And we're not going to shy away from doing that. There are people who are trying to intimidate us into being quiet about it, but we're not going to do that. That's not what we do at the gray zone. We actually are not afraid to challenge narratives, no matter how sensitive they are. Um, and no matter how much unanimity there is in the establishment behind them, especially when they're being used to justify atrocities, as is the case here. And that's exactly what the point of the story is. It's to say that these Hamas savages, they're so brutal, they're so sadistic, there's no there's no way we can talk to them. We just have to wipe them out. It totally plays in to the Israeli narrative that they need to wage this genocidal campaign in Gaza. That's that's why we're here. That's why we fight at the gray zone. It's to specifically do that whenever when so many others are too bought in, too sold out, or too cowardly to do it. Let me do one more. Just one more. We'll, um, yeah, so we have Zaka. We talked about them on previous streams. Zaka is key here when they refer to rescue teams. Yep. Uh, they're raising tons of money off of these lies and competing with another ultra orthodox rescue so-called rescue organization which has no they have no coronary credentials they're not qualified to examine dead bodies uh they're competing with them for fundraising who can spin out the most extreme allegation check my pinned tweet on my twitter profile for a really excellent explainer of uh, my research on zaka and others research um brad pierce wrote a great piece on substack um, but this piece is by Propaganda and Company, and you know, in ten minutes you'll see why they're frauds. The New York Times didn't care because they wanted this. They wanted this story. They believe in storytelling over journalism. So, um, here's one other figure that's interviewed. Uh, well, here, here we go. Is Yossi Landau in the house? The um, original fraudster, the original fabulist who cooked up the, uh, confirmed the non-existent beheaded babies, <laughs> confer, uh, uh, cooked up the, no pun intended, uh, I mean, I guess, no, United Hatzalah cooked up the baby baked in the oven fake story. He said that, you know, fetuses were ripped out of mothers. Um, he said that he, 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 he's responsible for Joe Biden, uh, sorry, Tony Blinken's lie before the Senate foreign affairs committee that an entire family was tied up and, and burned to death. Uh, and then Hamas militants ate lunch in their kitchen. I mean, this guy, how, how is it possible to believe him and feature him in a photo at the heart of your piece after everything he's done is lied. And he said that those who question him, he, he said those who question him should be killed like Hamas militants. And this is another key source for the New York Times. Okay. We're getting to the last um, so-called eyewitness I want. Uh, let's see if I can find it in here. It's just amazing. They're here exciting. They're citing a witness who's a documented fraudster, that guy from Zaka, peddled all these lies. Haaretz, the Israeli newspaper, had a long... I mean, if yeah. you want to be chauvinist who only trusts Israeli sources and Western sources, even Haaretz admitted that all the, the so many claims put up by Zaka were frauds, were lies. The Times can't bring itself to even mention that and treat this person as if he's credible. It's such malpractice in journalism. Uh, I don't know. And it's not as if they don't know this. They're not, they're not stupid. They know exactly who they're dealing with, but they're just willfully laundering propaganda and relying on fraudsters to do so. They know exactly what they're doing. And we can prove it. Um, and, and you know, a lot of people in Israeli media know they're doing it. Uh, this is And it's exactly what they did on Syria with the white helmets and so many other just documented liars. It's just, they want, 
these journalists wanted to achieve the same political objective that the State Department or the British Foreign Office and MI6 wanted. So th they're just willing, eager stenographers. Here's an, a paramedic in, Israel, in an Israeli commando unit who said that he had found the bodies of two teenage girls in a room in Kibbutz Berry. Okay, it's known who this paramedic is, although he hides his identity, and he is at least given an identification to other media, but for some reason, the New York Times papers it over. Hmm. It's, he goes by G, Sergeant G or Major G, and uh, Mondo Weiss has already taken him down. Uh, Mondo Weiss has already taken this down and I highlighted it on, tw on Twitter, their takedown. He was also interviewed by the, for the Jake Tapper propaganda special on Hamas mass rape for CNN. And he said the exact same thing as he said here. Um, so what does he say? He says that he found two teenage girls in a room. One was sprawled. One had her boxer shorts ripped and had bruises on her groin, and the other was sprawled on the floor face down. And he said that semen was smeared on her back. He found that, but they made no effort to do any forensic examination, even though this Major G is from, uh, or, or Sergeant G is from the Israeli Air Force Special Tactics Rescue Unit 669, which is an elite unit, which should have been able to call in forensic specialists. Okay. The problem is at Kibbutz Berry, and, and this has been confirmed by the families and by forensic pathologists and everyone who was there. There were no two girls who matched the description that G gives who were found in the same posture as these girls that G claims to have found. The closest match was Yahel and Noya Sharabi. So the Sharabi sisters, and it's incredibly tragic and horrible, um, but they were found in an embrace, according to the Times of Israel, with their mother when they were dead. They were not in any condition like that where they were supposedly killed with bullets, according to G, and they um, showed signs of rape. In fact, it was impossible to even really determine who they were, and the Israeli forensic teams had to use DNA and their teeth to identify them because they're so badly burned. What does that mean, Aaron? What does that suggest? And found in an embrace. Yeah. And um, I mean, I don't want to, I don't know what happened with these particularly two people, but, but you're saying that their description does not match the, the known list of victims. Well, the, according to the Sharabi family and to those who found them, they were not found naked with semen on them or in any position like they were sexually assaulted. They were found with their mother in an embrace and they were badly burned. Right. So their bodies couldn't even be seen, which suggests oh, that their how right. that which suggests their home was either hit by a tank shell or somehow burned by Hamas militants. Yeah. But we, we know we, that their neighbors in the the Pesa Cohen house were struck directly by an Israeli tank shell and the um, Hetzroni twins, two other teenagers were killed by the Israeli tank shell. So, and we know is, that the New York times, we know that, that the New York times recently acknowledged for the first time, uh, long after the gray zone did and the electronic intifada did that homes were hit with Israeli tank shells. And the way the times described it was, they said it was some light shelling. Yeah. Just a some light, light they, shelling. Yeah. Light shells. We're going to send in some Nerf shells. No, they killed everybody. They killed dozens of people in a house. Yeah. And it was uh, the commander that, that day was Barak Hiram, who's one of the major commanders in the Gaza Strip, who's become sort of a hero of Israel. He called in that strike and he lied about it, as Electronic Intifada reported. He lied. Mm -hmm. The New York Times didn't call out his lie. They just identified him there. Um. So... <laughs> This is amazing. We've we've debunked another key witness like just in a few minutes. And you know, it could have been done even more easily if the New York Times had looked into just the history that was already known of G. He is a documented fraudster that they were relying on 
And here's one of his greatest frauds. And it's just so obvious when you look at just the, just the vibe of this video, just look at the vibe of it. Okay. This is major G giving an interview to India's right wing Republic TV. And this is him turned around in a khaki shirt. We really don't yet. We can't actually even prove he was in Kibbutz Barry or that he even is a paramedic. He could just be anybody. Listen to what he says here. One of my teammates, he realized that uh, he saw a dog that was barking near a trash can. And we stopped by there and he opened that trash can and he pulled out of the garbage a baby, um, perhaps maybe not even a more than a year old baby that was multiple times stabbed all over his body and tossed into the garbage. One of my <laughs> I mean, I don't want to laugh at that, but it never happened. And his voice makes me laugh because he, and we know that because he sounds like a nebbishy guy from Brooklyn who's just making stuff up. Jerry, <laughs> Jerry, they found the baby. Because, and you know, again, it's, it's, you can't help but laugh because these things are so ridiculous and it's so sick. And so to cope with just the sickness of these people, you have to laugh at them because they deserve it. They deserve to be mocked. So we know yes. the list of victims from October 7th. Max, I mean, you studied this very closely. Were there any uh, babies on that list that were stabbed multiple times and found in a garbage? No. And you know this too. There was only one baby recorded among the dead on October 7th. Myla Cohen, 11 months old, was accidentally shot, uh, which is still horrible. And that's it. No one uh, any anywhere near the one-year-old age range was killed on October 7th. So he just completely made that up in October. He lied. And the New York Times didn't think to question this character who's already been discredited and proven to be a fabulous, just like Yossi Landau. How does this not just totally destroy Jeffrey Gettleman's credibility? How does he not get fired? Why is he not on the beach with a metal detector looking for loose change? Because the whole media is responsible for this genocide. The whole corporate media lied and lied. They wanted to believe everything Israel said, and they laid the groundwork to consolidate political support in Washington and London and Berlin for Israel to massacre thousands and thousands of Palestinian women and blow babies' heads off and burn babies alive in the Gaza Strip. And they are responsible. Jeffrey Gettleman, the New York Times, and CNN are an enemy of the people of the world. And in addition to being guilty of journalistic malpractice. And I mean, we got another, if we had another hour, we could debunk the even more in this story. And I'll be doing that in the days ahead. Again, yeah. Yeah. Just, just again, look at this. This is the New York Times, a New York Times key witness. Look at this character. This is a sham. Okay. You were saying. And, and, and what is the aim of it all? Again, we have to stress this. The aim is to justify the actual barbarism that's going on, the ongoing genocide, the ongoing mass murder of so many Palestinian babies, so many innocents inside Gaza. That's what all of this is in the service for, service of. Every single word that, New York Times puts into that piece. It's not about obtaining justice for anybody on October 7th. It's about justifying an ongoing mass murder campaign and providing the rhetorical, the emotional cover uh, for Israel to continue carrying out its atrocities against Palestinians in Gaza. That's what all of this is for. And we don't expect everyone to join us in debunking it as Max just did so masterfully. And Max, honestly, thank you for just you put in some time to looking into these claims and you've exposed so clearly uh, that some of the key people that the New York Times relied on are frauds, um, which then invalidates the entire thing. And we can't expect everyone to join us in doing that because, you know, most outlets just shy away from like, doing the kind of stuff that we do. But the least we can expect is to not be attacked for doing our jobs as journalists. And journalists are supposed to look at the available evidence and then apply rational scrutiny that's exactly what max just did and he shows that this is a fraud yet another fraud in the service of israel's genocide campaign by the new york yeah. Times. and why not just go with the reality of what we already know which is civilians were killed yeah which israeli civilians were killed on october 7th 
Yeah. Uh, that should be bad enough for them, but it's not. They need to go yeah. big because they're going to go big. They're doing big genocide. Big Israel is doing big genocide. So Aaron, you, you know, thank you. And uh, that's a perfect transition uh, because we were attacked. We were called out by name by someone who really represents the uh, embodies the constituency of Israel's propaganda campaign, the sort of pantsuit feminist, pussy hat liberal, um, very politically mobilized kind of people who are gathered around Planned Parenthood, who always vote in every election, who are active on a local level. Um, these, you know, who 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 was so furious that Hillary wasn't elected? Um, this is for them. That's why Hillary Clinton and Sheryl Sandberg were trotted out at the UN to introduce this phony narrative. And one of them, well, one of them didn't attack us. Um, it's Judith Levine, re self-described repro justice warrior, abolition feminist who suffers no fools, which means uh, she thinks she's smarter than everyone and has a condescending attitude, but she herself is a dupe for criminally mendacious government because she led her piece in the liberal legacy publication, The Intercept, with the following, as you pointed out, Aaron. One thing is true, Hamas and other Palestinian militants committed unspeakable sexual violence against Israeli civilians on October 7th. And then she adds that some individuals and extreme left organizations have denied these atrocities or upheld them as justified resistance. Nobody has upheld imaginary sexual violence or real sexual violence as justified resistance. And why don't you call name people? Okay. Well, exactly. Be because they've invented them and that shows their evidentiary standards. And this is not just the author of that piece. It's the intercept publishing it, which means that it's editors co-signed this narrative and didn't subject it again to minimal journalistic scrutiny. So they're claiming that people have held up sexual violence as quote, justified resistance. They don't link to any examples because there are none. They just made it up. And that shows the evidentiary standards they have to be assessing the claims of sexual uh, violence by Hamas. And by the way, um, to support this claim, they link to a paper by the Israeli group Phys Physicians for Human Rights. Um, in Israel. With, in in Israel. Israel, yeah. But the problem with that paper by Physician for, Physicians for Human Rights is that they acknowledge they've interviewed a grand total of zero people. And they also rely on the documented fraudster Zaka. So this all comes back to all these sources that are claiming that it's irrefutable that there was uh, all the sexual violence on October 7th. They all come back to relying the same documented fraudsters, whether it's the New York Times, The Intercept. And now here, this latest example you have up on screen, The Nation magazine, a columnist named Katha Pollitt, who was a major Russiagate dupe and attacked those of us who were not. Now attacking you and me, Max, here by name. Yeah. We're raising Jeez. questions about these sexual assault claims. Yeah. Katha Pollitt in her Russiagate fury accused Matt Taibbi because he was one of the, like a, a prominent media figure challenging the narrative. She falsely accused him of rape. And this caused serious problems with nation leadership. Um, I believe that lawyers had to get involved and they had to retract that claim by her, which was yeah. so sloppy and yeah. consistent with what she's doing here, where she says that le it leads October on October 7th, Hamas fighters raped Israeli women and girls. She just states it matter of factly with no evidence. The rapes are by now as substantiated, as substantiated as anything ever can be in an ongoing war. No, they're not. You're just intellectually lazy ideologically committed to some form of liberal Zionism and deep down inside you're a racist because you just believe Arab men are savages who are capable of playing, cutting off breasts and playing with them while they're on some military mission. She says, you have to be a conspiracist or rape denialist to dismiss all that as fabricated. No, you just have to go through the evidence and go through the testimonies in a very clinical and methodical way like we've been doing and question it and then the truth will come to light um and you have to question everything israel says because you know israelis are lying official israelis are lying when they're in public or when they're speaking 
So they're lying. So she calls us out, you know, Max Blumenthal claimed in a tweet last week and she, she cites a tweet by me. And then she says his gray zone colleague, Aaron Mate demanded to see purported rape victims offering direct testimony. Never mind that they are dead. How do you know that they're dead? But yeah. And by the way, all I pointed out was that there are not no purported rape victims offering direct testimony. That was just a fact. It's just true. Like I wasn't demanding. I'm just saying it's a fact. Um, you're claiming all this rape occurred, but yet there's no, n- 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 there's not a single alleged victim offering any testimony. That's all I was pointing out. Yeah. Well, it doesn't matter because like you may have pointed out more than that and you have, and I've offered a very substantive critique and we've been talking about this for a while now, but the she just cites two statements we made as though that's the entire s- scope of our critique. And yeah. then just moves on. Yeah. Uh, so she ignores our critique, but she also erases the many uh, Palestinian, Muslim, Arab women, women in general, who've been questioning this. Like so many women have been seeing this propaganda campaign for what it is. Yeah. And they're angry about it. And some of them are sexual assault survivors themselves who see it as cheapening their experience by using it to justify the massacre of women using something bogus to massacres, to, to, ju- to justify real massacres. Katha Pollock doesn't see it that way. Uh, why? Did, so she singles us out to, to make this about us being sexist, rape apologists and conspiracists as if there are no women calling this out and mm-hmm. making it about women versus men and yeah. reducing it to some kind of identitarian battle, which is extremely, and, and to polarize everyone on this issue in a gender-based way, which is just so cynical and so typical of the trashy techniques that she is accustomed to. We're not going to go for it. We should demand the right of reply because neither of us are ever are ever going to get published in the nation otherwise. And I think nation readers need to call this out. People who are watching this need to write the nation and call this out. And Katha Pollitt should actually issue a retraction, although I know she's an opinion columnist, But everything she wrote, including the eyes and the commas and the periods in her piece, is false. Uh, I think just this us showing the screenshot will give this article more visibility than it otherwise would have gotten. Um, I don't think too many people. Yeah, but I I understand what you're saying. But I think that what I think is that like Hillary's people came to her and got her to do this and to go after us because we become a problem. Um, you know, I, or whoever was involved in that UN event was Sheryl Sandberg and Hillary Clinton. Like, I think they expected more of a more more propaganda success, and we're in the way. So, I think this is an op. I think Pro- Katha Pollitt was given this, and th- people said, you know, you need to you need to help us out here. Like, this is not working out. Yeah, or she's just a standard dupe. And saw an opportunity to go after people who she doesn't like, which includes us, and to try to prop up a narrative that satisfies her own bigoted beliefs about um, Muslim men, which, you know, as you pointed out, I think is a major part of this. And I'm not afraid to point that out. I mean, you have to, I think, have, I mean, to be able to have such absent evidentiary standards, to be able to believe, parrot all these claims, to for everyone to link to the same Israeli group's report, which admits they have no evidence, didn't speak to any witnesses, and cites the documented fraudster Zaka, you have to, I think, have some stereotypical beliefs going on to be able to rationalize all this to yourself. And that's what I think is the case here. And it's funny to me, The Intercept, while putting out this piece, while putting out this piece that <laughs> says it's, you know, it's irrefutable that Hamas committed unspeakable sexual crimes. Um, they also acknowledge in the next sentence that actually it's not, the full extent is not fully known. But, you know, meanwhile, they're trying to fundraise off of their coverage of Gaza as if it's somehow unique and special. So they're trying to fundraise off their Gaza, Gaza, off their Gaza coverage and claiming that they're, they have moral clarity on this, that they're, they're, you know, they're different than the mainstream media. While parroting one of the, one of the key propaganda claims right now to justify, used to justify the Israeli assault on Gaza. It's just, it's, it's a funny window into how even alternative media works that, some people are just so gullible and so opportunistic or whatever it is that they just can't help but parrot the same propaganda that they claim to be debunking always. So that 
intercept fundraising appeal. I mean, they issued a fundraising appeal before this article. You pointed out the fundraising appeal was around Gaza and it was to give to the intercept and reward their quote, moral clarity on the issue of Israel's war on Gaza. And then they published this piece just validating, providing progressive liberal left cover to Israel's propaganda campaign. And that fundraising appeal was signed by Naomi Klein, whose first salvo after October 7th was to lecture some on the left for cheering Palestinian resistance and not taking into account the lives of Jewish Israelis. And then she had to actually ch have the Guardian, her editors at the Guardian, change the headline of her article because she got so much pushback, including from Rifat al who yeah. was subsequently assassinated by Israel. And now I'm she's just, like, you know, Naomi's leading all these JVP Jewish Voice for Peace rallies and she's out front. But we got to remember how people initially respond in the shock of major moments, uh, you know, psychological attacks. And it's like the beginning of Russia Gate, at the beginning of these major events, the beginning of the COVID event, how people respond as, uh, you know, as a real reflection of where they are. And if they have intellectual integrity, they'll at least acknowledge being wrong. Yes. I mean, on the COVID event, I mean, I, I can't fault someone for getting it wrong at the beginning. I, I, I was it was a massive those. psychological <laughs> attack using everyone's mortality fears. So absolutely. Absolutely. But you know, it's interesting. Um, Naomi's piece uh, t talking about leftists who were celebrating attacks on Israeli civilians, just like this piece, which claims that, the left has upheld sexual violence as justified resistance, doesn't offer any examples. So it's like left punching without even offering any examples of who you're punching. Um, it's just it's, it's just pretty cheap. And that whole thing of like, in general, of attacking people for positions that you actually can't show an example of, it's a really cheap tactic. And it's it's used to left punch. It's it's basically used, and it's used by, opportun by opportunistic Left leftists to basically differentiate to to differentiate themselves from their other leftists to show that they're acceptable to the mainstream. Whether that's intentional or not, I think that's what's behind some of this too. Is to like establish mainstream credibility by throwing other left wing voices under the bus so that you can be the approved left wing voice. I think that's what I'm seeing here, and people trying to parrot now these evidence free claims of mass sexual violence by Hamas something so yeah i mean and look at peter beinart and uh, who's tried to make himself the the darling of the palestine solidarity movement after co-authoring editorials with alan dershowitz at the daily beast calling for dividing the west bank into three really uh, i didn't know that that's oh, crazy oh i mean yeah i mean he was atrocious uh, he was he was trying he tried to be the voice of liberal zionism and then when he saw that intellectual wall crumbling he just moved to palestine solidarity then he you know tried to attack me over calling out russia gate and trump russia and then you know a year or two later he was warning of the hubris of the new cold war it's always like that for someone who's playing respectability politics and trying to maintain three paychecks at all times uh Mehdi hassan and peter beinart have both pushed this new york times article along with uh, Branko Marsetic at Jacobin, and none of them have done any of the, they're not approaching so it like reporting. reporters, they're approaching it like public figures who wanna show that they're sensitive to Jewish life or something. And they're, so they're not, they're not interested in the truth. So disappointing, but I, I'm not surprised to hear that about Mehdi and uh, Peter Beinhardt. Uh, you know, Peter Beinhardt, you know, I appreciate that he's someone who can uh, reach American Jews in ways that you and I can't just because the way we talk and how we're just we're not going to like try to like moderate our positions and, and be disingenuous but I do think for some people who are totally closed off to what we have to say there is some value in someone like Peter Beinhardt who can try to reach them with some humanity but that is still no excuse for propping up the narratives that are used to dehumanize Palestinians and I've noticed you know I've read some of his stuff he refers to the savagery of Hamas on October 7th, um, the barbarism. I've never, correct yeah, me if yeah. I'm wrong, someone, if I'm wrong, I'll correct myself. I've never heard him talk about Israeli savagery in Gaza or the barbarism of Israel. And I've also heard him say that, you know, Israel should respond to, should have responded to October 7th with targeted attacks on Hamas. 
which to me fundamentally misunderstands what all this is about. This is about an occupation. And an occupier doesn't, I mean, I've said this before, um, it has to be repeated. The occupier, Israel, doesn't have, the, doesn't have the right to fire a single bullet into Gaza. October 7th was a response, whatever you think of it, was a response to occupation. And therefore, Israel's only obligation is to end the occupation. They don't have the right to go into Gaza and do anything. All they have the, the obligation is to end the occupation and then negotiate a release of captives. That's it. Absolutely. And I think, you know, I have to, I have to jump off in three or four minutes because I'm actually going live on uh, judging freedom with Andrew Napolitano at five 30. Um, I'm getting, I'm basically getting a tan from the studio lights in here. Well, I don't <laughs> tan. I get like just burned. So, uh, you know, Michael right, Rappaport has to wear a lot of sunblock in the promised land. <laughs> <laughs> well, every time we do these streams, we want to get to Ukraine uh, because that's the yeah. Issue so we're else. gonna do that first next time because it's it, it's a huge story that we're just we just yeah. don't, don't have time to do next time. So next time we're gonna do it first, and uh, I guess include. I wanted to make a quick comment. Uh, and I, I think I want to talk about this more next time because we're talking about like the the left and all of this virtue signaling and so on. So many of the people who are just f you know cheering on Yemen now uh, and who are reeling in horror at what Israel's doing in Gaza, these are people who attacked us on opposing regime change in Syria and calling out the white helmets as a Western intelligence construct calling out the Duma deception, Syria, the destruction the assault on Syria and the destruction of Libya and all these regime change wars. This was, this is what paved the path to Gaza. It's all part of the same project. It's all part of the neoconservative march to Iran. Uh, and a lot of these elements, these NGO types and professional activist characters they were cheering on regime change in Syria for years and years and it viciously attacking us. So I hope now people are starting to see what this is all about as Israel is attacking Damascus airport again today, as Israel is attacking Hezbollah, which fought in Syria to stop Al Qaeda from completely taking over entire areas. Uh, and we'll talk more about that. But I mean, it is kind of another unmasking moment. For the left, Amy Goodman had a favorable segment about the axis of resistance on democracy now, which was cheerleading regime change for years and years and years. Um, so there's a well, lack of they, they they spoke favorably about the axis of resistance, but conveniently they omitted Syria uh, yeah. from even though Syria is an actual member of the axis of resistance, they didn't include Syria because they've been cheering on regime change in Syria, yeah. whether they I mean, realize the, it or not. If Syria goes, the axis of resistance is severely weakened, and that's the whole point. Um, and you can, we can see what Yemen is able to do. One of the poorest countries in the world by shutting off one of the key shipping channels in the world. I mean, it's sort of BDS in action. Um, BDS is a nonviolent civil society call, but it, it's the same spirit of economically choking or Israel or economically challenging Israel at a key choke point which is, I mean, as the Wall Street Journal acknowledged, is forcing the Biden administration to try to pressure, to consider pressuring Israel, but they're not doing it. Um, you know, what it was one of the first things that the so-called rebels in Syria did, they started dismantling and attacking the anti-aircraft surface-to-air missile systems of the Syrian army. They they, they destroyed almost 50% of the surface-to-air missile batteries in Syria mm -hmm. in territory that they con conquered and occupied on behalf of Israel, which supported them on behalf mm -hmm. of Israel. And you have so many of these influencers on Palestine who supported that. So they've been unmasked. And that's my my final point. Thank you all for, 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 all, the, for all the support and for staying with us for this stream and uh, liking it where de everything's demonetized on YouTube. Instagram's like just removed a video we had with 750,000 views. So like, subscribe, share, do all that, all that stuff. We're not asking you for anything except to, to watch us. 
can watch Max Blumenthal now on Judge and Freedom with me, Judge <laughs> Napolitano. Max, the audience loves you. We love you. Go watch them right now. Since we started this with the impression of Michael Rappaport, I'm doing my part too. Go watch my, Max now on Judging Freedom. That's pretty good, Aaron. That's Thank better you. than that's better than Randy Credico's impersonation. No, de definitely not. Definitely not. He's no, that was good. Uh, anyway, the judge wants you on too. So okay, I'll we'll join the judge. It, we'll make it happen. Here comes yeah. the judge. The judge. The judge. <laughs> Peace. All right. Peace, everybody.